There's always a great deal of debate when discussing what defines a supercar. For many people, the Lamborghini Miura was the first supercar. But for me, the most important criterion is the supercar should go over 200 miles an hour, which means that for me, the first supercar was the 1987 Ferrari F40, which is why there was so much excitement when just one year later, Jaguar launched their own supercar concept at the 1988 British Motor Show. A mid-engine V12 four-wheel drive projectile that instantly attached one and a half thousand, 50,000 pound deposits with deliveries promised for 1992. But it didn't quite turn out to be the car they expected it to be. Instead of a 6.3-litre V12, there was a 3.5-litre turbocharged V6, and it was only rear-wheel drive. So, not helped by the recession of the early 90s, a lot of buyers used that as an excuse not to hand over the extra £420,000, and so only 275 were ever made. And yet it was still a 532 horsepower, 213 mile an hour car, the fastest car in production at that time, and very much a supercar. Tom Walkinshaw Racing, who'd engineered the cars for Jaguar, built three carbon bodied cars to race at Le Mans, which had always been one of the aims of the project. And they actually won their class in the 1993 race before being disqualified over a technical infringement. And I raced one of those very cars the following year, sadly knocked out with engine failure midway through while running at a strong fourth place. But demand never really took off and production ended that same year. The other surprise when the 220 arrived was that it was big, a lot bigger than anything else around at that time, with its long overhangs both front and at the rear. And another reason why sales didn't really take off. And yet somehow it's now grown up with the times. Same sort of size as the Bugattis and Koenigseggs of the modern world, and its smooth, svelte looks have hardly aged at all. The XJ220 is on the comeback trail. And we've come here to Boots and Classic Cars, who are offering this car for sale on the Kahuna platform, which offers online auctions and classifieds with dealer reassurance. Bootsen? Yes, that Bootsen, Thierry Bootsen the Belgian three-time Grand Prix winner who now lives in Monaco and who set up his own showroom here in 2018 along with his son Cedric, specialising in sourcing, acquisition and sales of collector road and racing cars from the early 60s to the late 2000s. Tim, I'm very happy to see you again. I mean, Monsieur uh, Boutsen. Boutsen. Uh, Boutsen. Boutsen. Yes, Tiffany Den. No, I didn't need to. <laughs> what a pleasure. Yeah, All sure, these sure. years, and now we're in and, uh, We've been Monte Carlo. fighting against each other. Now we work together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure that the, the Monte Carlo circuit is a good place to test a, a 200 mile an hour supercar, but, but we should go for a lap well, of the Well, it's a very difficult place to test a car like this, exactly. but if the car was can do it, means it's a good car. We must go so, for a look. Yeah. Okay, let's take go and have me, a look. Yeah, take yeah, yeah sure. Lap. Fire up the um, V6 turbo. Ooh. Blowing going. Nice have sound. You, have nice you driven sound. this car a lot? Not a lot, but I enjoy driving it. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's a, it's a client's car and we need to sell it. So let's go. Doing some demos and <laughs> testing and uh, I really enjoy it. So Terry, you, you came here like many Grand Prix drivers to save a little bit of tax, but... Uh, well, the, 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 the tax system in Belgium was extremely expensive. It was, yeah. Actually, it was too expensive for me to live in Belgium. <laughs> so I decided to come here to Monaco because it was for me much, but, much cheaper. And then you stayed on. And I oh, stayed yeah. on. Why and have I you gone home? Because I love it here. <laughs> and it's a nice place to live. The sunshine is there almost every day. I can practice in my cycling. I can do... I have the uh, businesses here. The kids went to school here. Oh. The school system is extremely good in Monaco. So you're Monegasque and now. Uh, No, I'm still Belgian. <laughs> you, still Belgian. Do, you, do you bump into Max Verstappen having coffee in the square sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. Him or Gerberg or KK Rosberg or some other drivers that are here. And there's quite a few, a few cyclists, a few football people, uh, yeah. players and sports uh, men, tennis men. I was a very good friend with uh, Thomas Muster when he was playing and living here. 
The only so trouble is, Tim, it's a, it's a bit busy in Monte Carlo. I mean, we're, this is, we're on the start finish straight and we're doing five miles an hour. Tim. Yes, this because, the because uh, there's a lot of exhibitions in Monaco. Not oh, only okay. the Grand Prix, where it's, it's the busiest time of the year, but at the moment there's preparation, preparation going on for okay. the Monaco Yacht Show. So today is a bit so busier than normal. There's going to be a lot of people in Monaco for the Yacht Show, which is going to happen next week. And uh, that's it, you know, it's a small place, a very small place. So how, was your, how was your Monaco Grand Prix? Did you have success here? Never really. I had a lot of bad luck in Monaco. I give you two examples. I was once in 1987 driving the Benetton. I was lying fifth during the, the beginning of the race behind with a group of leaders. I was together with, the, with, yeah. with Senna, Prost and with them. And the car was good and I was driving safely and softly and the drive shaft broke, oh. so I lost it. A bit later with the Williams, I was lying third in the wheels of Senna and Prost. I really, in their wheels, I mean, I was a half second from them for most of the race, and then I lost the middle part of the rear wing. So I nearly went off, had to come into the pace, change a wing, went out again, and that was it. This would have been good results for me, and uh, I, 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 wish I, remember I, don't, I don't say I would have won, but <laughs> I would have been on the restaurant for sure on these two occasions. I always remember this for me was the, the most epic experience of driving a Grand Prix car around Monaco. I didn't, I didn't quite qualify in 1980, but that wasn't my fault, the car was shit. But coming up here, yeah, yeah, the yeah, top yeah, of the yeah, hill, yeah, yeah. I felt like I was in a, in a spaceship. Because yes. there was the visibility when you come up this hill, you only see 200 meters, it, and then you come to the crest, and you have to you know break the most, the crest. The most impressive moment in my whole career is driving Formula One car in this bit of the circuit yeah, exactly. with 1,500 horsepower oh, you, you and qualifying the, tires. Yeah. We had wheel spin because of so much power and the car oh, was not, not very good. Wheel spin the until the fifth. Here, did yeah, you have to break had, before the crest then? Yes, but we had wheel spin until the fifth gear going up the hill oh. and then stabilizes and immediately on the brakes. Uh, so into the casino square. This is yeah. the, <coughs> the approach I would have thought here was the hardest corner on the circuit. <coughs> Yeah, it's really tempting to go too fast here. Yeah. To break too late over the crest. Uh, Hotel de Paris. Uh, Hotel, you have you have a lot of people watching you for sure. <laughs> uh, Elio De Angelis crashed, Nigel Manson crashed here. A lot of people had an accident by overdoing it. And it's one of the most technical corner period. Yeah. yeah. Down the hill yeah. with a hairpin. This is not very technical here, just uh, no, hate you need to get the good rhythm for the acceleration, brake, acceleration, yeah. brakes. And take the hand off the steering wheel exactly. for the extra yeah. turn. But they put the big flat curb on the apex now, which makes it so much easier. Exactly. I think the curb was like a oh, ramp. Yeah, yeah. Then plunging down the hill to the corner where even Senna can make mistakes. This one is Schumacher and the other one is Senna. Oh, that's right, Schumacher, <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. I raced the Jaguar XJR15 here. That's one make series in 1991. Really? And we, we couldn't go flat through the tunnel. We were on opposite lines. Yeah, but that's, that's a, that, that was a driver's, no dri driver's problem, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, it's, yeah, a, it's a very delicate. I, I, to, to be honest, I've never ever been flat through the tunnel in any car. Yeah, the it, except one. for uh, Formula 3. Formula, Formula 1 was flat. No, 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 no. I lifted, I mean, confidence lift for. <laughs> Half a centimeter. One more epic corner. This. What's the name? This was also. It's Bureau de Tabac. The Tabac. Bureau de Tabac. Tabac. Tabac what yeah. a, and you exit right on the barrier. Yeah. There's no. And then no into gap the swimming pool. In my year, we had concrete walls both sides. Concrete walls, so and it was a real corner. Today, yeah. it's absolutely flat, flat out. So well, no, it's a shame. It annoys me. It's, it's a shame. Yeah. They, I know. I think the right place now, Thierry, is to head for the mountains, please. I think. I think really, we need yes. to test the car properly. Yeah, yeah, we sure, need to sure, go. Sure. And I'm driving it very hot. Three I don't think the air conditioning's working that well. Iconic view of Monte Carlo. This is what everybody thinks of with Monte Carlo. Yeah, the harbour, yeah, this is where I live. This the palace. Do you live in the palace? No, 
not on. quite, not quite, not yet, not yet, not yet. But incredible, no. you know, 20 minutes ago we were stuck in a traffic jam doing there's a lap a, of the Grand Prix circuit, now we're up Everybody's the concentrating there, but when you get out of it, there's so much fresh air, clouds. I mean, it's not so hot like you, down you there. You drive the car up here, we're yes. impressed. The I'm turbo. very, very, nice. very impressed with the car. Yeah, it's nice. a very good engine, very well, good that's, power, that's good torque. That's my turn to drive now. You, yeah, 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 sure, go, go, go. Delivery, isn't it? It is, yes. And the brakes, sort of, yeah, yeah, brakes I'm getting used to. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's surprising. It's now nice, the steering huh? becomes light and there's feels there. I'm enjoying this. I it's don't know why this has become a bit of a mystery car. <laughs> but it does feel very docile. The turbo comes in smoothly. Yeah, very, yeah. it it's feels a, quite civilized. It's a very good uh, engine. It's not a big engine, but it's very nice. This takes me back. For an engine like this, you know. I did Le Mans in one of these, yeah. so it's taking me back to 1983, flashy round on 1984. We didn't have cyclists though at Le Mans, which was a good thing really, because it, it's a bit tricky on these roads. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the steering the is function. heavy at slow speed, isn't it? Steering is heavy, the brakes heavy, but you get used to the brakes, so that's no, no yeah, problem. The brakes are better. Yeah. I drove the very first car on the Top Gear film. Yeah. With no power assistance to brakes. No, this and one is, this You needed two good, feet to yeah. slow it down. <laughs> but now they've got a servo, which makes the handle. What lot I of like about the engine is the, 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 the range. You can use it from 1,500 yeah. RPM up to 7,000. And it has power all the way, so, and torque yeah. all the way. So, really nice to drive. And that's why the first gear is long, but it's not so much of a problem. I'm still in first gear. But your traffic on your yeah. Monaco roads. You can stay in first gear all the way. But what's the reliability like on these? I mean, is this where you can't get them serviced in many places? This no, car you can... have one, one dealer in each country that can service the cars, yeah. and they're very used to it. They're, they're very, uh, they know the car very well. This one has been maintained in Sweden for the last, uh, last time when the last owner had it. And that car has been maintained through uh, official service centers and dealers yeah. all its life so okay. we have all the documentation we have i mean the car has been very well maintained all the way you can feel that you drive it and there's absolutely yeah. no problem so no 26 000 miles is that high mileage for these sorts of cars so or kilometers that? kilometers, oh, kilometers. So, so it's okay. about 18 000 miles okay. so it is more than some cars have no mileage at all but i would prefer to drive a car which 27 000 kilometers and has been maintained all its life yeah. properly. True. Instead yeah. of a car that's been standing 10 years in yeah. a workshop without moving, without without maintenance, because all the the joints and the gaskets and everything gets dry, and then you have leaks. And uh, it's better to drive when the car is made to drive to be to, to run. So if you run it constantly, then you have no problem with maintenance. So do you know the history of this car? Where yes. it was born? The full history. It was. It went from UK to Germany, from Germany to uh, back to UK, then to France, then to Sweden for with, the, with the actual owner. So it's had a few changes. It's been sold twice with uh, by auction as well, and each time for a higher price, which means that uh, this car is getting value now every. They're every on the year. comeback trail, as I said I earlier. Think so. yeah, I, think I think so. I think so. If you look, they're so underpriced. Really, what do you think now? If it's you look at the competitors, I mean that car was made. Yeah. To, to compete against the Porsche 959 and the Ferrari F40. And these cars have got values way above million. What about the colors? Are any special colors? What, do you know the choice of color? Well, it's all linked to, to race tracks and racing activities. Of course, yeah. I remember, yeah. Yeah, you have, uh, oh, because this uh, is your favorite color then, because this is. This is a silver spa. Bar. spa, I, spa I want spa. the Silverstone Green. <laughs> Silverstone Green, you read red uh, for Monza. Uh, and so on. You have five different colors. I like this one because it's Spa. Spa is yeah, Belgium. Yeah. Belgium is, is my bias. country of origin. Bias. So, yeah. and the Spa is the most beautiful circuit in the world. So, if I had to choose the color, I would take it just because of the name. Not only because I like it. Do you know why it's called 220? XG220? No, it's just a number. Just a number, yes. Because the car one, was the 120s and the 140s, so yeah. that was yeah, yeah. 
like the 140, they put a number which was the speed, the top speed ah, that the car yes, was yes, designed yes, for. Yes. So the 140, XK140 was made to run at 140 miles an hour, and this one 220. And it never got quite got there though. No, 230, but within, within I think. 13, 14, depends on what you, who, right, who you listen know. to. I think two, 217 is the maximum I've seen. But anyway, it's very close. And I'm sure if you tweak it a little bit, you can <laughs> pass this speed by a long way. You know, 275 cars have been registered. This is chassis 291, yeah, 291. We saw that. Yes. So, <laughs> that so it's the very last chassis that's been produced. Okay. One of the very last. But the chassis that they are not counting in the 275 are the ones that have been used as a pre-production or test cars. Okay. Originally, the car was designed to have a 12-cylinder. Yeah. So do you think four-wheel drive? Yeah. So it would have been a better car, you think, with the V12? Yeah. Okay. But imagine a V12 in this type of car would be very heavy four-wheel drive very heavy yeah. the car today has been modified or changed or adapted to the competitors that has much lighter cars like ferrari the f40 is about 600 kilos lighter than what this car would have been right because the 12 cylinder is very heavy four-wheel drive very heavy then they wanted to have ABS systems that at that time with big computers was very heavy too. So, so it's actually a it better was, car for it, having the V6. It was on the numbers and on the, the kind of a, let's say, emotional side, 12 cylinders sounds much better than six cylinders. Yeah. But it makes no sense to have a 12 cylinder on this car because it would make it much, much heavier. I think just by changing the engine and the gearbox, and the, the four-wheel drive, you would add 300 kilos to this one, which would make it totally out of out of race with the, with the competitors. Okay. So yes, it is six cylinder, but it's a fantastic six cylinder. Really, really nice to drive. You feel it. You told yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even you told me that. <laughs> oh, oh. And you, must not have any scratches on it. If you were not a racing driver, I would be scared. <laughs> If you want to buy Jaguar XJ220 chassis number 291, it's in a Boots and Classic Cars auction powered by Kahuna.